Now, not surprisingly, perhaps, the papers more or less all agree that the aftershock of Trump is the story. Here's the Sunday Telegraph. Trump-Putin alliance sparks diplomatic crisis. We're going to be talking a lot about that. Um, the Observer has going it alone, not an option. The NATO chief, that's Mr Stoltenberg, warns Trump. And there's the Sunday Times. Britain's plan to tame Trump as if he's some kind of silverback primate. And he's sitting there like a silverback primate on the front page, um, plus much else. Um, other papers go on other stories. Uh, the Mail on Sunday is a story about the shame of the Poppy Day profiteers, a charity being banned in a crackdown on rogues ripping off our heroes, it says. But let's start. Um, as promised, with uh, Mr. Trump and Christiane Amanpour, front page of the Sunday Telegraph. Well, indeed, Andrew, this is Trump-Putin, alliance sparks diplomatic crisis. And this is something that has been a big fear of the West, obviously, even during the campaign, because of the very close and cosy and warm relations that both men have expressed towards each other. Uh, Putin is, is assumed and believed to have interfered in the U.S. democratic process and indeed in democratic processes around the world. And now people are very concerned that Trump might uh, 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 accede to Putin's view that that's his sphere of influence. Already Peskov, Dmitry Peskov, his spokesman told me that one of the first things Trump could do is pull back or slow down NATO deployment on the border there. And then, of course, you have the Syria issue where Trump views Syria in terms of how Putin does. So the people that should be most worried would be the, the Baltic states and the Poles and so on, the Russian border at the moment. I think that's the case, but also the entire post-war security alliance is potentially mm. about to be turned on its head. Richard Dan, Lord well, Of course, Dan. that plays into the um, front page story on The Observer about NATO. Now, Donald Trump has been saying what other people have been saying in the past, that America can't pay the bill indefinitely. The better part of 70% of NATO's costs <coughs> are paid by the United States. And I think there's a real opportunity for the UK here we're leaving the European Union, but within the framework of NATO, there's a chance for Britain to take a bit of a lead here. We are spending 2% of GDP on defence. I think we should up that a little bit to 2.25% and, and actually show that we are taking our own defence as part of Europe seriously. I think there's an opportunity. It's the right thing to do. I think it's also a way of actually seeing off Donald Trump's isolationism. Because if we are seen to be stepping up to the plate, then frankly, his uh, argument is, 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 is trumped itself. Trump. <laughs> and can I ask you, Richard, about the, um, the future of our relations with the other European defence partners? Because post-EU, we know that um, uh, uh, Brussels is talking about a new European army and we're not terribly keen on that. But presumably we have some trump cards, I must stop saying trump cards, in terms of... <laughs> GCHQ and security. We have things they desperately want, so we can have a close relationship post-Brexit on defence. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think the relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States on defence and intelligence has always been very close and will be very close. And that puts us in a unique position in Europe, in a position of leadership, which is why I think if we also upped our defence spending, we'd really strengthen that. And I mean, and just going on exactly the same thing into the uh, Sunday Times leader, our mission to bridge the Atlantic gap. We don't want to get too carried away with that. But there's a real opportunity, I think, to sensibly influence how policy will be formulated in Washington in the future. And I think that's, that's worth having your eyes open to. And we mustn't talk ourselves into a total gloom. Well, We've absolutely. got good news on the front page of the I Express. I mean, there's, there's huge opportunities on the Express here. You can talk about, uh, we can look at the opportunities for trade uh, going into uh, page two and, and, you know, responding to this new opportunity. There's a great chance to do a very quick limited trade deal in 2017. Get it ready, get it agreed ready to sign as soon as we leave the European Union. And that actually means that it'll enhance our negotiating leverage with the European Union. If German car manufacturers see that actually we've already got a deal lined up that'll reduce tariffs on, for example, uh, American cars, they'll be worried about seeing more Jeeps than Mercedes on our streets. That's a positive thing. And is there a real chance for us to do that? Because I thought that Trump was a protectionist. I thought he wanted more tariffs and more barriers. Well, I was at the convention in July, and it was made very clear to me then, and it's been made clear since, Britain is at the front of the queue. And isn't it interesting, the first politician that he's seen is someone from Britain who's helped him, Nigel Farage. Uh, it's in some of the newspapers, but there's a picture here of them meeting yesterday. They spent an hour together, hugely positive and about you, his relations with... And you've spoken to Nigel Farage I spoke to then. Nigel after that what meeting. What did he tell you? They, they spent just under an hour together, and he said it was a very warm, positive meeting. You know, Trump is uh, very clearly an Anglophile. And isn't it interesting that he's already agreed to put the bust of Winston Churchill back in the Oval Office. I think that tells a very important message. Just a little word of caution, so did George Bush, and did you see the wars we had? Yeah, but there's a, there's Could a, this be maybe a, a backlash no, to what a, we've had there's in the a big 2000s? Difference. Tr Trump is a deal-maker. 
and he wants to put America back to work, and we've I got think huge opportunities really to build on that. Because what he's done with China, because I interviewed a big Chinese official this week, very concerned the Chinese about a trade war, as you bring up, Andrew, and about a potential global recession, which could backfire here as well. Let me just return to the Farage question, because he's photographed gurning with Mr. Trump on the front page of the Mail, for instance. There, the big, big grins together. And it's been suggested that he could have some kind of role as a bridge between our government and the Trump administration. But the Tories don't like him. Well, he doesn't is, like the Tories. I just don't see this well, working. Frankly, everybody needs to be grown up about this. It's so much more important than petty party politics. This is our national interest. We have a huge opportunity both in terms of trade. There's another opportunity to do a joint tax deal mm. so that we can reduce the ability of global multinationals to avoid tax. That could yield billions of pounds and dollars for us, uh, both in our national covers. And the sort of people that Trump is going to have in his cabinet very, very different. Billionaires, potentially. You could have two or three billionaires, the likes of Tom Barrack, uh, the likes of Steve Mnuchin. Tom Barrack, somebody you've Tom Barrack is someone that I've spent uh, about £300 million of his group's money over the last couple of years. These guys are from the world of private equity. They're real deal makers. They expect things to happen and fast, and they don't take no for an answer. As, I, think, sorry, uh, I think the other thing that's worth just observing in one of the papers, um, Donald Trump and Theresa May, that might have been the 11th phone call that he made, but actually Vice President-elect Pence um, rang Boris Johnson, who took a call in a meeting in Belgrade, and he was the first person that he spoke to. And I think that indicates, actually, they do want to talk to us. Now, one of the things that appears to be happening is there's movements of, kind of protest, mm -hmm. upsurge, going on all around the world against the way things are. Um, and in Europe in particular, those, are, th those protests are going to parties of the right and the Observer has a very, an interesting double-page spread there of all the right-wing yeah. European leaders yeah. who and may benefit it's not just in the right. next phase. Of it's extreme right, it's hardline right, it's nationalism. white nationalism. And I think one ought to be careful about what the agenda is. And I, after Brexit, did not think Trump couldn't win. I also was at the convention. I was on the floor of the convention. I also interviewed Nigel Farage, who was very pro-Trumpian, pro-Putin in his view too, but that's more of that later. But you've just interviewed Marine Le Pen, who believes she can win, and so does the French establishment now. It'll be about voters who've never voted before and who come out, if it's, that's the case. I just wanted to ask you about that, because conventional wisdom yes. is that the, the Republican Party in France will choose either Sarkozy or, more probably at this moment, Juppé, mm -hmm. and then what happened last time round, you go into the second round, and it's Marine Le Pen against a mainstream right. conservative, and the French electorate, they, socialist, they did last time. conservative, all rallies round That's behind right. the anti-Marine. That's right, they did Marine. last time, but so are why, we in, this time? why should it happen this time? If we are in this tectonic shift, which, for better or for ill, it looks like we are with Brexit, with Trump, um, it's possible. Also, there is this sort of momentum view of history. Also, we're in a moment where it's an individual. Do you know what? It's, it's individuals mm -hmm. who are saying all sorts of things, including things that they may never, ever, ever be able to deliver. And these are the people who are appealing to the fear, to appealing to the genuine hurt, and they have their own very narrow white sure. backlash agenda. But sadly, too many people have been left behind by the establishment and they're actually now, they've got the confidence to say, actually, we can vote for change. Yes. Let's try something different. Now, I use the perhaps slightly lazy thing as a kind of march of the right, Richard, but actually there are very, very different forms of right. There's free market yeah. right, um, victorious in Britain, as it were, and then around the world there's protectionists as well. So there are very, very different and, political and, philosophies and, and, all under this and umbrella. And frankly, I think this is old school language. I think we need to talk mm -hmm. about the march of common sense, the march of getting people back to work and, and pragmatism, and, and you know, investing money, whether it's in security and defence or whether it's in rebuilding infrastructure. Actually, the same issue is here in Britain, and that's what I think uh, you know, our Chancellor should be looking at yes. with our autumn statement. All of these are really important issues that our voters want to see. I, I don't think no. it's old language, and let's just say, no. seriously, because Angela Merkel is the only world leader who's had the guts to actually make a conditional offer to Donald Trump, saying, I congratulate the American president and the American people. However, our relationship is based on all mm. these values, and she named them all, including mm. minority rights, including uh, different orientations. And she said, based on those joint common values, okay. I offer cooperation to Mr. Trump. But I think on that, this that's day of all days, we must not forget the, the, the large coverage of the commemorations and, and, and all of that. Uh, Lord Dannett, you've um, chosen, I think, something from the looks like the sun to me there, is it? Um, actually, it's, it's the people. It's, it's, the people, it's an article it's by Dan Jarvis. Um, Dan Jarvis, leader. someone I've known for quite some time, and actually, I think a future Labour leader at some point. Bless him. Was he, a he was one who was a paratrooper. He was a paratrooper, right? major yep. in the parachute regiment, and is now a Labour member of Parliament. Um, a, an excellent individual, and he's making a very fair point here under the headline, 
wear your poppy for a better future. Um, of course, we remember those who have died in the, in the world wars and the conflicts since, but he's particularly focusing attention on those who um, have come through the wars and particularly drawing attention to the need to do more for those with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so the, the, more recent, the more recent people, and in a, in a sense on this day, we have focused very much on the First World War and the Second World War for obvious reasons, but then there's all the other wars since. I think you've just written a book, Boots on the Ground, about the British Army post-1945. Well, that's right. Um, Britain and her army since 1945, focusing on that score of campaigns. Um, 1968 was the only year in which Britain didn't lose someone on operations until last year. We've been, as the British Army, on stage in every act of the epic saga since 1945. But um, Danny's quite rightly pointing here to the fact that we need to do as much as we possibly can for our veterans, particularly those with mental health issues. And they often take a long time to reveal. The statistic is 12 or 13 years since leaving the forces before uh, asking for mm. mental health issues. So Dan's absolutely right to draw attention to that on this day of all days when we remember those who lost their lives in conflict but actually for those who are still living, the conflict continues. Well, I think that's, we could talk all day, but I think that's a good note to end our paper review on. Thank you to all of you for that.